church. A throwback to 2022, which seems like a million years ago. I'm on the tail end of my second round of COVID in solidarity with seemingly like a third of the church that's had it this summer. It seems to be the thing to do. Fortunately, my symptoms have been fairly mild. I'm just tired, which is more tired than usual. But since it's Labor Day weekend, I'm going to treat us all to a shorter sermon, though probably not an energetic one. Let's see what happens. My parents had a garage sale this weekend, which my siblings and I happily contributed to. Most of what I brought was my late grandmother's stuff that, was, that my parents had left in my basement. The point of a garage sale, for me, is not to make money. If it were up to me, I wouldn't even put a price tag on anything. Just, just make me an offer. Because the point isn't to profit, it's to get rid of junk. May it no longer be my junk, but someone else's junk now. We have too much junk as it is. But for some people, getting rid of junk is difficult because they don't see it as junk. That's a a bad word to use. It's stuff. Sure, it's been sitting in a box for 15 years, but what if as soon as you sell it, you need it? What if the person who gave it to you as a gift eventually learns that you no longer have it? What if after you sell something for $5, you discover it's actually worth $5,000? So I'm descended from at least two generations of hoarders, so I know these questions well. And the reasons why we allow our houses to pile high with junk that we don't need. But there are other questions to ask. Thanks to her show on Netflix, Marie Kondo got people to ask, does this spark joy? Now, I never watched her show or read her books, but it it makes sense to me. We should assess the value of the things in our lives. Now, most of our possessions are not kept for their monetary value. Though though I did notice that Costco has been selling gold bars lately. uh, I feel like I need to have a wall safe or a vault to buy one of those. But uh, as we know, things that aren't worth a lot of money can still have great sentimental value an emotional value to us, way more than bars of gold and silver. But that can be harder to assess. But even harder is when we need to assess ourselves. What is our value? Why are we being kept around? Do we spark joy? I'm reminded of the 1999 workplace comedy office space where a company is downsizing and two consultants are brought in and they ask employees, so what would you say you do around here? What do we do? Now, I believe every human has inherent value, which is why it makes it so hard for me to unfriend somebody on social media. But people have a purpose too. Are we contributing and doing things of value? For Christians, the question we must ask ourselves is, are we bearing fruit? We're concluding a series called The Great I Am, where we've been looking at the seven I Am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. We see at least six of them throughout this room. They are statements of divinity, recalling the name of God given to Moses in the burning bush, I am who I am. But they're also mission statements, describing the work that God is accomplishing through Jesus. And today we'll be in John chapter 15, where Jesus said, I am the true vine, as well as I am the vine, and you are the branches. Beginning in John 15, verse 1, we read this. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. 
Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The metaphor of a vineyard is one that's used often in the Bible. But as with all metaphors, we, they can be kind of like riddles. And we have to understand what is Jesus saying in all of this? What does it mean that he is the vine and we are the branches? Now some of these I am statements can be confusing, both for the original audiences and for modern readers today. But what John 15 is about, in my opinion, is closeness. Jesus wants to be close to his people. Remain in me as I also remain in you. That's also translated as abide in me. It's to have a continuing personal connection to Jesus who's saying, stick with me. Stand by my side. Be attached to my hip. Jesus wants us to be so close that there's no distinction between him and us. Just as when you look at a vine or a tree, you don't focus on the individual leaves or branches. It's all one plant. And Jesus desires for us to remain closely attached to him because when we do, we receive life. Branches are nourished by the vine, receiving all that they need to prosper. And how can you tell a prosperous branch? By the fruit that it bears. And when we are closely connected to Jesus, we receive abundant, eternal life that results in our prosperity too. Now, the so-called prosperity gospel that many televangelists preach says that Christ leads to our physical comforts and financial gain, but that's not exactly the prosperity that Jesus envisions for us. Throughout this series, I've pointed out that these I am statements are Jesus' mission statements, declaring what God is doing in the world through him. He is the bread of life, the light of the world. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the good shepherd. But here, the mission statement includes us, because we're connected to him. His mission is our mission. His work is our work and our work is his work. Or to use that vineyard metaphor, the fruit we bear is his fruit. And what is the fruit that Jesus is talking about? What does it look like? What does it taste like? Well, it's not going to be all that surprising to anyone even vaguely familiar with Jesus' teachings. Christ the vine nourishes us with the life that bears the fruit of love. Continuing on in verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be made, may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And this is my command. 
Love each other. It's really all about love, isn't it? The ultimate mission of God, and therefore our mission, is to love and to joyfully bear the fruit of love. Now, I'll be honest, that's hard to preach. Not because it's difficult, but it's just so simple. Well, at least it should be simple. Love each other. There's really nothing to unpack or expand on that. What, what more can I say? How often can I just point at the greatest commands that sit next to me on the stage every week? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. And yet, we can never forget, and we must continually remember that this is what we are called and commanded to do. For if we don't bear the fruit of love, we are at risk of being pruned by the gardener, thrown into the fire to be burned. And that sounds frightening. And it is. But when we think about it, is it all that unreasonable for God to just ask us to love each other? God takes love and failure to love very seriously. And on the day of judgment, if we have failed to love, what justification will we give to God? What reasons could we possibly give to God to not love each other? Like he specifically commanded us to. Oh, we can certainly think of many excuses. They're too different. They're too wrong. They are sinners. They are my enemies. They don't deserve it. All those excuses are junk. I don't care if they've been sitting in a box for decades and just part of the furniture, but they have got to go. They need to be pruned from our lives before God prunes them for us. Because they keep us from bearing the fruit of love in the way that the gardener needs and expects us to. Cut them out. Cut them off. Because none of those excuses are good enough for God, who has demonstrated unconditional love for those who were different, those who were wrong, those who were sinners, those who were enemies, those who didn't deserve it, for all of us. And because of this, he says, go and do likewise. None of those excuses are good enough for God. He calls us to follow the example of Jesus who laid down his life for us in love. That is the master's business which Jesus has let us in on. That God is on a mission of love because God knows this world needs it. And God knows that while the message is easy, the application is hard. Loving each other is easier said than done. It's easy to preach, but difficult to practice, especially to the extent of self-sacrifice and self-denial that Jesus requires of us. But if we remain and abide closely to Jesus and remain continually connected to his overflowing and unending love, we can absolutely do it. Jesus nourishes us with the love and life and grace and compassion and power that we need to love each other fully. We cannot do it ourselves. Jesus said that in verse 5, apart from him, we can do nothing. We cannot love the way God needs us to love. And God's people tried in the Old Testament, but we weren't enough. 
God then became human to show us what it looks like to love the way God loves. Then God gave us the power of His Holy Spirit to love that way too in faith communities of love. What happens when God's people live and love prosperously? Well, we spread like a vine. We branch out. We multiply and we grow. That's what happens when we love each other, lay our lives down for each other. People see that. And they know in their heart that they need that. And they want to be a branch on the vine too. And to all of them we say, welcome. For it is a life-changing way to be in loving community with one another. Because it is the way that God created and designed us to live. And he desires for this whole world to be. And God's mission will not end until that happens. When the vine of God's love spreads across the entire face of this earth. And one day it will. But until then, as God's branches, we must bear fruit wherever we go, whether it is at work or in school or in the stores and the restaurants we go to, wherever we go. May God's love be seen. For that's the gospel that we are preaching. And the good news we are proclaiming not just with our words, but with our lives. We are doing so with Christ's love. May the world see it and know it firsthand. If you're here today and you want to know more about Jesus, we would love to tell you all about him. You can be baptized and receive forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And by the Spirit, we are empowered to help each other in love. And if you're struggling today, if you're going through a hard time in life, know that you are not alone. If you need prayer and encouragement, you need some love, we are here for you. Just let us know. You can find me, one of our shepherds, Stephen Ministers, anyone here. We're here for you. If God can minister to you through us, let us know. And in all things, may God and God alone receive all glory and honor and praise. Amen.